All right, so going back to soils and then also soil fertility, um, we kind of went over um, on Tuesday, we went over where we get our hydrogens from and how during the nitrogen cycle and that oxidation process that we lose those hydrogens and those hydrogens go into the soil and increase our soil acidity. And so the way that we decrease our soil acidity or try and neutralize that is by applying some lime material. And so um, we mentioned one of our reaction types being a hydrolysis. And so calcium carbonate, which is a liming material, undergoes hydrolysis, this reaction with water. We form this carbonic acid in this hydroxyl, and as our hydroxyl concentration increases, what happens to the pH? It increases. This will undergo some change. water and this carbonate and we have increased our pH because we have this hydroxyl. So now we have a hydroxyl and water and we've neutralized some of the acidity based on once the calcium is uh, uh, hydrolyzed this can now exchange on the soil colloids with our hydrogen or maybe an aluminum. It would take three calciums to replace two aluminum. Then we'll undergo some other, um, some other reactions. This, may, um, this hydroxyl will associate with an aluminum and form gibbsite or some other uh, primary mineral. So just to understand that we need to add water so that we can dissociate the calcium from the carbonate we will get a release of hydroxyls that will increase the pH, and then this calcium will bind with some other, um, either uh, will displace aluminum that can then form gypsum. So is that basically like they put the calcium carbonate and they watered it in? And yeah, sure, so you apply the lime, and then when it rains or they water it in, this is the reaction that happens. It's just it's a simple hydrolysis, much like when we did urea hydrolysis. We added water, the molecules changed, and we got ammonium, and then uh, the carbon dioxide gave off, and we have water. So here we have our negatively charged clay. I left my clicker. Uh, then you see we have aluminums. Uh, there's a hydrogen or so there. These are our acidic cations. We add lime, it undergoes the calcium hydrolysis. We add more calcium, and that displaces the aluminum to form aluminum hydroxide, which is gibbsite, right? Now remember way back when I talked about aluminum hydrolysis, those minerals that form, that is the mineral that forms um, an aluminum hydroxide. And you can see now we have replaced that aluminum with our calcium. So it's a very simple concept. You're gonna add water and lime, um, I'll try and get a, um, a lab on this um, along going along with our, we're going to go over relative neutralizing value and find this factor again and things like that and then hopefully get a lab that demonstrates that. i got to get some chemicals for that then. We don't have any chemicals in this building other than coffee. All right, so the way that we, um, our lining requirement, we're going to send it off to the lab. The lab will perform our pH, bu our, our buffer pH, and they will figure out a lime requirement and then give us back a recommendation based on our base saturation and our acid saturation. <coughs> That's an equation that is for soil chemists. Just understand that when you send the soil test off, when it comes back, they've done all this work, and now it is up to us to go find the material that we need in order to meet this recommendation. That's kind of what we're going to do today. So um, our RNV is going to be composed of, y'all remember this from soils, composed of two things, the fineness factor, and then also the purity of the liming material, the calcium carbonate equivalent. All right, so remember that we said that uh, if, uh, we have three sieves, we have a 10 mesh, 
and I guess we can use this as a good example. So we have a 10 mesh and a 60 mesh. Let's just say this was the 60 mesh, right? So we would add our line material in the top. Some of it would not make it through the 10 mesh, which is kind of a very, uh, it's, a, it's a coarse sieve. The holes are large. So that is not good. That, that, that has no reactivity. So it has an efficiency of zero. We're going to throw that out, send it back, and let them break that up. That has to undergo some pulverization so that we can get some reaction. Next, we have the R60 mesh sieve. And so whatever falls through the 10 mesh, but not the 60, kind of our medium texture, our, our fairly coarse size, is going to be 50% effective. And so if 17% falls through, half of that is effective. So we would have 8.5. Next, everything that falls through the 60 mesh is that really fine powder that's going to have a large surface area that is going to react very quickly, and all of it will react. That is worth 100%. So now we have 80%. Our, um, our finest factor is 88.5%. All coming back. All right, so for um, example A, 16% didn't make it through this 10 mesh sieve, good or bad? Bad, throw it out, doesn't count. Half of 39% of it made it through the 10 mesh, but not the 60. How effective is that? Fit? What's that? 19.5, so half of 39 is 19.5. And this 45% that made it through both sieves is 100% effective. So our total would be 64.5. We got that by adding 19.5 and 45 to get 64.5. And you would just continue to do that for each one of these lining materials. different materials and um, you might want to ask your supplier what type of material that they do have um, because some materials are better than others and so they may or may not have what your calcium carbonate equivalent is or the fineness factor they may have already just said you know what it's 95% effective or it's 85% effective so um, when we figure out our calcium carbonate equivalent, we're going to do this based off of the molecular weight of calcium carbonate, because it's the equivalent of it. And so I don't know if they did this on purpose or if it just so happened to be that way or what happened, but for some reason, I know the reason why, it's because of the way that the molecule is structured, but the molecular weight of calcium carbonate is 100. So we can use that as a very good baseline for how effective this material is. Um, so that would be 100. If you were to divide the molecular weight of calcium carbonate by the molecular weight of magnesium carbonate, 100 divided by 0.84, someone got that? You have 119. 119, so that's how we come up with this calcium carbonate equivalent that is greater than, so we would need less material of this magnesium carbonate because the lower the molecular weight, the better it will dissolve. It doesn't have as many raw reactions to go through like we have the calcium carbonate. When we add the water, the magnesium and the carbonate will separate very easily. When we get down to magnesium oxide, if you were to divide 100 by 40, and get 250 because this magnesium oxide will dissociate in water much quicker than the calcium carbonate will. And so as the molecular weight of the material decreases, the calcium carbonate equivalent increases. So you would need less material. Did you need that? 
guessing? No, I was just writing down what you just said. So as the molecular weight decreases, the calcium carbonate equivalent increases. And you would need less material. So as molecular weight decreases, the amount of material you need decreases. Now that we've determined what our CCE is and we have our fondness factor, all we're going to do is multiply those two together. And we will get basically our guaranteed analysis. So rate over analysis. Once we know the analysis, we get a recommendation from the lab. And once we know that, we can begin to start to um, collect our material and how much we're going to need. So multiplying 0.885 times 0.80 gives us a RMB of 70.8. This goes in with all the fineness factor, um, how much of that is going to react. Also the um, molecular weight and how easily that dissociates in water. So when we apply our line to water it in, we know that we're going to get the same amount of reactivity as if we had 100% calcium carbonate watered in. I will also try to make sure that I get all the notes posted online that we have gone over. So that way y'all can use those for study material. set up our simple equation where we have 2,000 pounds of this calcium carbonate equivalent which is what we would need for one ton. Our example material, in one pound of our example material there are 0.708 pounds, 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 pounds of calcium carbonate calcium carbonate material. So we are going, this is our rate over our analysis. We'll divide 2000 by 0 0.708. And so we will need nearly one extra ton because it's not pure. If this were 100% pure calcium carbonate, everything fell through the floor, we would need, or everything fell through those sieves, we would only need one ton of it. Um, and as our, if our calcium carbonate equivalent were greater than one, we would need less material. Some other things to consider when we're applying lime um, is how much change in pH we want to have. Um, remember that when we change pH, just one pH point is on a factor of 10. So if you go from 4 to 6, that is a factor of 100. If we're to go from 4 to 7, it would be 1,000. Um, I was talking with Dr. Earhart, and he said he wanted, he had some, he wanted to change his pH from 4.5 to 6.5. And he called up the co-op and told him what he wanted to do, and they said, maybe you'd have a blanket of lawn this thick in order for that reaction to happen. Um, and so remember, we have, that, we have the active acidity that is in the soil. When we apply our calcium carbonate material, some liming, it is going to neutralize that, but our soil colloids are going to replace it with the exchangeable acidity, that hydrogen and aluminum that are still on, on the outer edge of the soil colloids. So it has to happen over time. Because as we add lime to it, 
we're going to add more aluminum or hydrogen to the soil in order to neutralize the lime, which will add the lime to neutralize the acidity. So that equilibrium of reactions going back and forth. Uh, one example of this that I have like in the lab um, when I'm trying to make solutions be a certain pH. Um, I really had this with my PhD because I was trying to make sure that all the solutions were you know, 8, 8.5. And I would have to add either ammonium hydroxide or uh, hydrochloric acid by drops. And I might be right on the line and I would add it and I'd watch the pH change and go up and then I'd watch it come back down and I would think that if I add just a, a, a little bit more it would move but it didn't. And so then when I get tired of it I go and then it works and then it sends the pH. So there's a very fine balance between when the pH is going to change based on that calcium, the hydroxyl concentration and hydrogen. I mean it's a fine line and I mean you can't it doesn't take very much to skew that one way or the other. So it has to happen at a slow rate in order to effectively neutralize it. Uh, for golf course situations, there is an opportunity for us to add um, gypsum and this will take away some of our aluminum toxicity but not raise the pH. And so when we add the calcium sulfate we undergo this hydrolysis reaction. The sulfur exchanges the hydroxyls and ultimately forms aluminum sulfate. So if you ever have a situation where you don't want to change your pH but you have a lot of aluminum, you do a soil test and realize that there's an aluminum toxicity, but the pH is okay, add gypsum to form this secondary mineral, and now it is neutralized. Does that just get released somehow, or how does that not change the pH? Um, because you still have the hydrogen activity is still there. It's just forming this extra mineral, and there's no movement of uh, 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 acidic concentration. This is still there. It's just the plants won't take it up. Or we, when we release this, uh, when we release the hydrolysis, during this hydrolysis, uh, that hydroxyl will bond to form that aluminum hydroxide just like we did with the calcium. So it just takes away the aluminum, not necessarily the hydrogen. So we still want to keep our pH the same. We can add gypsum to that and not have to. And also we don't have to wait on um, the liming reaction to happen. That, that calcium sulfate is going to undergo that hydrolysis reaction a lot. Other ways to change pH, um, we can use organic matter, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna sound like a hypocrite. I'm gonna say one thing, and then we're gonna go right back to the other one, and we're gonna change the thing. So, um, if you add P, um, if you add organic matter, uh, we can hold on to this uh, calcium a little better from our pH-dependent charges. Uh, it might bind some of those aluminums also because of the pH charge or the pH dependent charge, uh, it will form the complexes and some of it might contain calcium. So if you have organic matter there, there's a potential for this aluminum sulfate to also be like maybe add to that as well. Um, Sometimes if you want to add, if you want to change and lower your pH, um, for uh, blueberries like um, acid, um, acid soils, so tomatoes, um, but also azaleas. And you can change the color of your hydrangeas by changing the color of your, by changing your soil pH. Um, 
You can also add acidic organic matter. And so when I worked, when I began my PhD, we were looking at um, coal that had been crushed to a fine powder, and you add these humates. You might have heard Dr. Earhart talk about humic substances, or humates. Uh, it's one way that we can change the pH uh, back to acid. We can also add elemental sulfur or any of our ammonium sulfate type materials. Anything with sulfur is going to decrease your pH. And then possibly adding aluminum. And they, you know, these are very rare situations that you would have to do something like this uh, to change your pH, to lower your pH. Um, you typically do not run into that very often in ag, but you might in ornamentals, and you might in um, nursery. We have a problem out at the farm where we have these chestnuts, and we have they're just high pH and they cannot grow in that soil because they like acidic soils. And it doesn't matter what we do, like Kenny Pierce has added humates and elemental sulfur and it just, the pH will not change because the, the soil has enough calcium to neutralize when we're trying to do it the other way, we're trying to neutralize. It will neutralize the aluminum or the sulfur that we're adding to the soil. So if you have a soil that has 2% um, calcium carbonate, which is something you can get from a soil test, it will require 6.4 tons of elemental sulfur in order to neutralize that calcium carbonate. Use your notes for this assignment. 